Whistleblowers. 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 Blowing the whistle. Whistleblowing. On March 11th, 2013, an internationally diverse group of top whistleblower experts and advocates gathered in Berlin. The event, Whistleblowing for Change, was organized by Transparency International and hosted by the Heinrich Böll Foundation, with support from the European Commission. Whistleblowing, when people take matters into their own hands to expose secretive acts of wrongdoing, has become one of the most powerful tactics to fight corrupt, illegal, fraudulent or hazardous activities. Throughout the world, countless lives and billions of dollars have been saved thanks to the actions of whistleblowers. In the United States alone, the government has recovered $35 billion in stolen and misspent funds since 1986. Some of these heroes, and the people who stand behind them, gathered in Berlin to support the building of an international whistleblower movement, a movement to strengthen the legal rights of whistleblowers, to help protect them from retaliation, to parlay their disclosures into positive change in the world, to honor their devotion to the common good. Now, more than ever, we need a truly international effort to give whistleblowers the rights and recognition that they deserve, and to formally engage whistleblowers in the fight against corruption and other wrongdoing that harms or threatens the public interest. Here, we bring you highlights from Whistleblowing for Change. I just wanted to start with, in my short introduction, with a story, because I think that actually a lot of whistleblowing cases start with stories. Um, in fact, this was a story that uh, my colleague Mark told me. Uh, and it's about a man called John Kiriku, who some of the Americans in particular here will be familiar with. Uh, John Kiriku, who barely two weeks ago walked through the gates of the Federal Correctional Institution um, in Loretto in Pennsylvania in the United States to begin a two-year prison sentence. Um, and he had been an analyst with the CIA, with the US Central Intelligence Agency, and he became involved with a case uh, uh, that regarding the torture of prisons by the US military, including by waterboarding. Um, Kiriku did not order the torture, nor did he supervise it, nor did he carry it out. In fact, he had absolutely nothing to do with, with the torture. What his crime was, was to tell the public about it. And for this, he's going to be locked up until May 2015. Meanwhile, the people who ordered, supervised, and carried out this torture remain free. And they're unlikely ever to face justice. Whistleblowers are people who are without doubt brave, and they're sometimes ahead of their time. They expose corruption, financial fraud, and political crimes. Information that eventually might surface anyway, but not always, for sure. And the information that they, they bring to the public is shocking, so shocking sometimes that the spotlight and the blame is redirected from the message to the messenger. Laws, indeed our laws, must not be written to protect the oppressive values of the past or the powerful of the present. Our task today centers on working together to make sure that people everywhere have laws and moreover the freedom and the comfort to allow them to speak up without suffering the consequences. Whistleblowers are a rampart against corruption. Where institutions fail, in this pursuit people can succeed. The key question is, at what point should an employee resolve that allegiance to society must supersede allegiance to the organization's policies and then act on that resolve by informing outsiders or legal authorities? There is a great need to develop an ethic of whistleblowing which can be practically applied in many contexts, especially within corporate and government bureaucracies. For this to occur, people must be permitted to cultivate their own form of allegiance to their fellow citizens, not to the bureaucracies, and exercise this allegiance without having their professional careers or employment opportunities destroyed. Indeed, the basic status the basic status of a citizen in a democracy places the responsibility to society over that to an illegal, negligent, or unjust policy or activity. Today, our responsibility is to find ways to help each other, to help those who put themselves at risk to help society. To see how international collaboration can lift up all of our efforts to improve whistleblower protection 
so that citizens everywhere can commit the truth without being punished. Whistleblowers, regular people like you and me, are helping to write a new book. If people are to trust their government, the people must be convinced that the government trusts them too. Without protections for whistleblowers, all whistleblowers, neither kind of trust can be complete. At a national government level, we have, I guess, one of the world's A-grade histories of complacency, um, of assuming that everything is good, um, that everything, that there's no corruption, uh, that everything works squeaky clean, um, and that really we lead the world and therefore we shouldn't be looking or we don't really need these sorts of systems and protections. But people who know Australia and know its place in the world could think of uh, Australia government, former recently Australian government owned entities like the Australian Wheat Board, which was caught um, involved in foreign bribery in Iraq a few years ago. Um, we currently have Australian owned companies that print banknotes. Whistleblower protection became a real issue because of real corruption scandals where police officers, where nurses, um, where there was real evidence that people either had tried to blow the whistle on serious wrongdoing, um, medical malpractice, risk to health and safety, serious corruption, or that very clearly there were people there who, who uh, could reasonably believe would have spoken out had there been proper processes and systems in place for them to speak out, either internally or to regulatory agencies or, if necessary, to the media. It's quite good to have a symbolic piece of legislation that says, well, we've done something. Um, the trouble is, as many people here would know, is that that can turn into a massive trap for whistleblowers because, in fact, there can be no real protection on the ground and no real change in the way that organisations work or the reprisal risks. Um, but government says, but we've got a whistleblower protection law. We faced an absolute explosion around corruption, uh, whistleblowers being, being badly treated. We're now no longer feeling that legislation is, in fact, sufficient uh, because now whistleblowers are being assassinated. Uh, we're looking at some kind of fund that can be used to provide additional security to whistleblowers. We've uh, launched a whistleblowers calendar, which actually celebrates some of the successes. Because obviously, you know, you don't want to hear whistleblower, disaster, fired, death, all in the same sentence all the time. And in that in that calendar, we try to you know, put forward some of the some of the success stories, but um, I have to say that <clears throat> in terms of way forward, we really are thinking that legislation and policy work is very is is really such a small percentage of what we need to do. It, we're, we're really having to look at community mobilisation, protection of whistleblowers in the communities that they live in, support to the families of those who've died. Um, and, and recognition of them, bringing them into these these remembrances, so that they feel that their their families haven't, family members haven't died in vain. When terrible things happen, they say that they would do the same thing again, which is something that I, you know, I, it's just one of those characteristics we seem to have as human beings: is that if we if we have a sense that a thing should be in a particular way and we believe it's right, we will often continue pushing that and doing that even in the face of, of immediate personal threat. And, and, you know, that's one of the reasons that we, we really wanted to do the calendar was to celebrate um, some of those heroes. It took the deaths of two very young public sector employees who complained about corruption in the oil sector, which is under governmental control in a big way, and also construction of national highways. In at least one case, the complaint about wrongdoing went all the way up to the Prime Minister's office before the murder occurred. It was after these murders, there was a huge public uh, outcry, outrage. The government came up with a whistleblower policy. It passed an executive resolution. So very often the village, uh, what we call the uh, panchayat, which is the local self-governing body, actually says that this road has been constructed. People living in the village will know what road exists from which point to which point. And the next year when, they, when, when, when the same village uh, you know, body claims that another road was built, so then they decide to file their information request and they find out that the first year, the road that was constructed was from point A to point B and the second year it was from point B to point A. So that is when they, they, they you know, it, it's not about just seeking information. The citizen 
citizens are now activists citizens activists collect the information go to the uh, you know site of that particular public work and actually verify things the indian law also allows for collection of samples used in construction uh, you know uh, works and therefore they're able to even show that the quality of materials used is so poor and this is happening in many many parts of india both developed and developed uh, and and uh, less developed the the media are 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 uh, uh, exposing every day a lot of uh, scandals about corruption about horrible things that are happening but nothing happens there is a deal bit with the other with the other side political side and they get things you know just okay fine we didn't say anything so what we would like to see as lebanese is what after whistleblowing what after the disclosure so uh, that's the, a major issue for us. I, I don't like to be accused of defamation, but a lot of prosecutors are corrupt. So, <laughs> 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 uh, and uh, I mean, it's very difficult sometimes to push, or maybe not corrupt, maybe they receive themselves threats. They are threatened. I mean, I know judges who wouldn't dare uh, giving any, any judgment, uh, they don't dare to settle any case because of political pressures, but because the politicians interfere in every single, uh, at an, any single, at any level of the political life, especially now, for example, we are having uh, uh, legislative elections soon. So, I mean, they go crazy. And the distribution of money and uh, anything, just name it. Uh, the media in Lebanon, we have a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, freedom of expression, but we don't have free media. Uh, every who owns the newspapers? Politicians, <laughs> politicians, and you know people with a lot of money. So uh, we don't have free media. We don't have any single free journalists. They all on a payroll of someone. All of them, even if they just they are simple employees in a newspaper. This newspaper is getting paid by a politician also. He's one of the major uh, shareholders. So of course, the journalist to preserve his pay and his, uh, he wants to work at the end of the day, he has to conform with the uh, general instructions given by, without accusing this person of being corrupt, just, uh, just uh, because he wants to live and get paid, he will, he will uh, have to obey the instructions given by his uh, hierarchy. I think it's a process that involves more than whistleblowing uh, alone, because whistleblowing alone without a powerful judiciary or some, something that pushes the judiciary that, to work uh, seriously and hard, there's no point to have a law for the sake of having a law. Within Australia, what we've got is a situation where we do have a uh, reasonably well-functioning free media most of the time, but it's contracting. It's, it's a, as a result of globalisation, the ability for any news organisations to, to have the resources to put into serious journalism is massively under pressure. So we've got a different... I suppose if you want to look at a system like Australia's where you can look at it and say, well, everything's functioning quite well, what are they worried about? Well, what I guess we're most worried about is, is the fact that we're always at risk of backsliding. Um, it's, it's, we're always at the risk that things could, really bad things could happen tomorrow and the type of traditions and institutions that we thought were there to prevent them or to address them are in fact not there anymore. I quite frequently appear on panels like this, often with defense lawyers, and they attack me as they say, I'm the lawyer for the snitches. And sometimes uh, in, in my hours of thought and ponder, I wonder about the ethics of representing people who use inside information and speak out. So I guess if anything, um, my visit the other day to Sachsenhausen with my son, who reminded me that the atrocities that occurred then occur across the globe today, um, reminded me of the importance of this gathering. And uh, it's something that I, uh, I think that probably we should all, all keep within us. Uh, we have large multinationals that are engaged in human trafficking, subjecting workers to uh, work without proper pay, uh, subjecting workers to clean the screens of the iPad, which I hold up, 
and expose themselves to toxins that uh, ca cause neurological disorder. We had a board of directors that had six chartered accountants and uh, three solicitors on board. Uh, we had all the due compliances and check box, box lists that you could ask for. Um, and even so, the embezzlement went unnoticed, um, although I would like to suggest many people did notice but didn't have the moral courage to speak out about it. So I think in terms of, of a stakeholder value, yes, indeed, I do think that having a whistleblower on board or someone that's prepared to pick up and, and speak out about wrongdoing does add stakeholder value. We know from research that ethical companies have a, a much greater value on the, the stock exchanges these days. Is um, whistleblowing adding value somewhere? Do whistleblowers have something of value to add to the company? I think they have a grip on something that belongs to the company and should stay there, and that's their knowledge. And that, of course, needs uh, requires, on the other side, somebody who's willing to uh, receive this knowledge and take care of it, make use of it. For six or eight years, the company say whistleblowing, that's... That's not our part. Risk management, we do that, but not whistleblowing. Whistleblowing, it's too danger. Uh, they say that. Now, we have, the, the world has changed. A lot of people fight against corruption, and uh, the companies to, uh, think about, okay, it's a big reputation. If the case go to the prosecutor or anything, uh, I need the case, and I want... Uh, to solve the case, and the whistleblowing is more and more important. I, I think there's a lot of companies nowadays that tick the box in terms of compliance, but they really aren't effective in managing a, any kind of risk whatsoever. It, it, it's, it's, it's like a dummy. It placates shareholders. But the question I'd like to ask is how real is it? So we all have risk management, and we need to realize that usually it's working and risk communication, whistleblowing, is also usually working. That is the, an, a message, I think a very important message, that I try to convey to these insecure organizations who believe, well, we can't really have whistleblowing because our organization is not mature enough. Maybe parts of the management is not um, in a listening mode enough or is not able to handle what is coming in systematically enough. And that's, I think, what the four of us can probably add to these organizations to help them uh, really handle 100% of the information that they already have or that may come in from the outside or whatever. I believe personally, and, and this is through my experience, having worked in a corporation, having blown the whistle, and then spent many, many years trying to understand what truly went wrong and whether the, the sort of legalistic procedural uh, policies of, of companies and corporations are going to remedy this. Uh, and the outcome at this time, um, the, the way that I feel is yes, I do believe there have to be legalistic uh, uh, compliances. I do believe there have to be some internal processes. But most important, I really think we need to look at the human psychology around why people are prevented from blowing the whistle. Why, why are people not wanting to come forward and speak out? One of them is, yes, we fear retaliation. It, it's a real fear. This is where the legalistic uh, protective acts can come into play. Uh, the second one is, perhaps I'm not going to be heard or listened to. So yes, let's put a procedure in place. But this, the third is, Maybe nothing's going to ever be done about it, so, so why should I bother? What sort of sanctions we need is sanctions for management who are not able or not willing to use information properly that is readily available to them. Um, I, I, have, I have more of a uh, sort of, a, I, I think, or not more of, but I have a practical perspective, and that is, is that I come from the view that corporations and states operate through temporary caretakers. That, uh, Pfizer is fundamentally a, a good company. It's created for a proper purpose. It's created to help people, but it goes askew when its leadership acts for its own economic gain. And the way you, uh, the way you change the behavior of a company is by punishing those who misguide it. And you know we've seen that with states around the around the world. Um, and unfortunately, that has not happened in the United States. We have 
uh, large companies like Pfizer and Glaxo and Abbott, which I was involved in, and nobody's gone to prison. In the, in the Glaxo case, they attempted to prosecute uh, uh, one attorney who allegedly made misrepresentations to the United States government, and, and the government, our government, was unsuccessful. In the Pfizer case, the CEO was later uh, given a job on the board of the New York Fed. Uh, so in effect, he was he was rewarded. And until you change behavior that way, I think it's going to be wrong. The second thing is is that the penalties that you impose on large corporations only go so far. And how do we make good people even better? And how do we make other people want to join those good people? What is it about moral courage? What, what is it about whistleblowers that, that allows them to stand outside the group and to, to dissent around the decisions that are being made in a group scenario, group dynamic? So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of understanding um, how and what makes a person a whistleblower? What sets them apart to, to, to be prepared to take the risk and speak out against a group? Um, and then to cultivate that. Um, and that, as I said, that starts from, from young, young children upwards. Um, and hopefully we can actually uh, start putting that into practice, into schools, and also into corporate organizations. So it, it, it certainly is the badge of belonging. It, it's wanting to be the hero. The evidence is overwhelming that insiders are the best source of information often about what's going on inside those organizations, problems like waste, fraud, abuse, and other forms of wrongdoing. Uh, and if insiders are not free to speak, then there is no transparency. Uh, and then the problems and the wrongdoing and the corruption will only grow worse, fester, and grow. Given the intense workplace pressure to not rock the boat, as we heard this morning, those who do make waves, the whistleblowers, often get dismissed as kooks or cranks or whiners or disgruntled employees, which is ironic because in American popular culture, we celebrate courageous individuals who won't buckle under to business as usual who take a principled stand against wrongdoing. There's cop Frank Serpico fighting the corrupt New York police force, or Karen Silkwood revealing radiation exposure at her nuclear plant. Cigarette company executive Jeffrey Wigand providing the hard evidence on tobacco addiction. Single mom Aaron Brockovich fighting for environmental justice. And Catherine Bulkovic blowing the whistle on a sex trafficking ring in Bosnia. And we who work with whistleblowers know these people, or people like them, many of whom risk their careers, their friendships, even their marriages, to do the right thing. And why? Because they have a strong moral compass, and because to do otherwise, they couldn't look in the mirror in the morning. Rosemary Joanne Liang is a physician, and she is a scientist, and an extraordinarily good-natured person, uh, but not one to keep her professional concerns to herself. Angry is, not, is simply not who she is, and Rosemary didn't feel like a whistleblower. She preferred the term lamplighter, someone who shines a beacon on a problem, which is just what she was doing. So maybe there's a word in German for lamplighter, I don't know. Anyway, clearly more lamps need to be lit. So legal protection is essential, but whistleblower victories are often won in the court of, a public, of public opinion more than in a court of law. Mobilizing community support for the whistleblower, shining a light of the media on the problem, publicly shaming the wrongdoer, enlisting the attention of oversight authorities, all of these extrajudicial acts are critical to shielding the whistleblower from retaliation and bringing about real corrective action and change. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have taken the lives of tens of thousands of people, as we all know, including many American soldiers, whether they should have been there or not. The families of the fallen GIs rightly expect that the remains of these soldiers will be treated with the utmost dignity and respect. And it's hard to imagine a more solemn obligation of a government when it puts its young in harm's way.
And if there's a breach of this duty, it cuts very deeply, and the conscience of the public is properly shocked. Three members of the civilian staff of the Air Force's Port Mortuary in Dover, Delaware, disclosed to OSC that the remains of soldiers had been repeatedly misplaced or lost, and their families were not notified. A fallen soldier's badly mangled arm was sawed off without his family's consent to fit his mutilated body into his uniform for viewing. Fetal remains from military families were carelessly stored in cardboard boxes with the blood dripping onto the floor at the mortuary. The mortuary command did not appreciate the whistleblowers coming forward with these disclosures and engaged in acts of retaliation. The story led the news cycle on TV and the newspa in newspapers, and it gained either further traction after reports surfaced that the mortuary had been incinerating soldiers' remains and dumping the ashes in a landfill in Virginia without informing the families. In a public ceremony, OSC honored the mortuary employees as the Public Servants of the Year in 2012. There were many poignant comments from members of Congress about how the whistleblower's courage brought systemic change to the mortuary. Speakers also noted the important message sent to management by removing the bad actors and retaliators from their positions of authority. And there was praise for OSC's role in helping restore the whistleblowers to their jobs and reputations. None was more powerful or moving than the voice of a tearful Bill Zikorowski, who thanked OSC for saving not only his job, but his life. We do have two American governments, and one looks very much like a democracy where civil liberties and freedom of speech, uh, freedom of the press, and whistleblower protections are, are valued and upheld, and the other one looks like a national security state where all of those rights can be waived if only national security claims are raised. And so in this area of our government, we are seeing um, uh, really frightening uh, developments uh, for whistleblowing, but also for our democracy. I mean, the United States is not the most dangerous place in the world to be a whistleblower, but it's among the most complex. And I remember hearing Tom Drake, who is a national intelligence whistleblower, um, he was asked, what advice would you give a whistleblower in the U.S.? And he said, get a lawyer. It is very difficult to defend in a judicial setting whistleblowers at the UN or at the multilateral development banks because the only access they have to a judicial process is internal to the organization. They go to an administrative tribunal where the judges are paid and appointed by the institution that's being sued. We have a huge public demand for transparency. People's uh, appraisal, where whistleblower is not anymore some professional or somebody from inside the ministry, it's just ordinary citizens. Some office people sitting in the offices and checking declarations, discovering information and putting it in front of the officials. And uh, this is something relatively new, but when it's compared with uh, existing institutional uh, norms, it creates uh, uh, explosive combinations. When we say that about the United States, we're talking about an enormous sphere of public sector activity, that the budget for the Defense Department, the Defense Department alone, not the intelligence agencies, for 2012 was $729 billion in the United States. It is about 25% of the, of the federal budget, and all of those operations have been moved behind this wall of secrecy, and that means um, corruption, because there's so much money and there's so much secrecy in that one sector. Um, 
whistleblowers who have come forward in that sector and they've tried internal channels first before going to the media, even before coming to us, uh, have been prosecuted as criminals and as enemies of the state, which is probably the most serious charge you can bring against uh, a citizen. It does sound, from what people have said in different countries, that whistleblowers' motivations are largely uniform, oddly enough, um, across cultures. They don't speak up if they're afraid of retaliation. They don't speak up if no one's listening, if they don't believe uh, that there's any meaningful procedure in place to protect them. And they don't speak up if they believe that nothing will be done. Why should I risk my kid's college education, my mortgage, my job, if in the end uh, nothing is going to happen. Both things are necessary. The, the legislation is necessary, the legal procedures are necessary, but also the press is necessary, the parliamentary work is necessary, uh, and the work in education is necessary. And, and what we try to do is to get them to work in parallel. That is, we have a whistleblower who's in court. We make those disclosures public as much as we can to put as much pressure on the government if the government is the adversary or on a private company if the private company is the adversary. And that creates a demonstration effect for other whistleblowers as well as a deterrent effect on retaliators where we haven't ever gotten, um, and maybe we will one day, is, is, is to get to a point where retaliators themselves are subject to punitive sanctions either by their corporations or by the government. So the reality is that whistleblowers are regulators now, and we are their support system. And that is bad news in the sense that they're terribly unequal parties now. It's an individual up against a system, one single person against a government or against a corporation. And um, this came home to me when I saw the indictment of um, <coughs> Bradley Manning, Bradley Manning versus the armed forces of the United States. That is a position you do not want to be in. You don't want to drop a whistleblower law into a hostile legal environment. There have to be other kinds of uh, legal protections that are, that are also there. Um, however, and many people have said that these laws are hypocritical uh, or they're public relations. Uh, covering up a lot of quiet resistance. But we know, those of us who've worked on legislation, that good practice often comes from legal hypocrisy in the end. Anyone can be a voice for change. When you speak up, society listens. The world changes. <laughs>